Hello, America. It's Ted from Consumer Cellular, the guy in the orange sweater, and this is your wake-up call. If you don't have Consumer Cellular yet, now is the perfect time to switch and save. For a limited time, new customers can get wireless service for as low as $15 a month for your first year. Yep, the same exact nationwide coverage as the leading carriers for $15 a month for an entire year. What are you waiting for? Call 1-888-FREEDOM or visit ConsumerCellular.com and use code RADIO15. See ConsumerCellular.com slash FIRSTYEAR15 for promotional details. You're listening to Castrol CarCast on Podcast One. Hey, it's Adam Carolla. Thanks for hearing me out. I did a live or live by live show, I should say, in Houston with Dan Crenshaw, who's a war hero. You remember him from Saturday Night Live and the whole controversy. Anyway, he's a congressman. He's a hero. We had a great dialogue up on stage and uh, it's all here for you to Enjoy. Thank you. Streaming live from the improv in Houston, Texas, courtesy of Live by Live and Podcast One, this is the Adam Carolla Show. Adam's guest today, U.S. Congressman Dan Crenshaw. We'll also talk to the president of the Houston Food Bank, Brian Green. Plus, performances from Graham Parker and John Hyatt. And now, such a pessimist, he sees today's socially distanced audience as half empty, not half full. Adam Corolla! Thank you, guys. Well, we got a lot of heroes here tonight. Dan Crenshaw, hero, has uh, joined us. Uh, I think we have a lot of first responders here tonight, so uh, tip of the cap and a clappity clap for you guys. And when I... When I say clap, I don't mean the venereal disease. I mean actual... Come on, anyone over 40 who remembers venereal disease is called the clap? So much nicer than herpes sounding. So uh, we're going to uh, pay homage to a couple of folks that have really uh, helped out here, and then we'll go right into the show. First, uh, we should bring up... Oh, let's see, I got the wrong card here. Let me make sure I got the right card. Oh, yeah, I got the right card. From the uh, Houston uh, Food Bank... Brian Green is here. Come on up, Brian. Well, socially distance, but uh, you're... Uh, well, I'm trying to... Why don't you try into this microphone and just kind of tell us what the Houston Food Bank's all about. Well, the Food Bank, normally we, uh, we provide food assistance for families in need. It's just right now it's dramatically changed. It was, you know, it's almost like a curtain dropping on the economy. And uh, so we've been distributing about a million pounds a day um, wow. through uh, all these different site distributions. It's been a lot of work. And, and all the money from uh, today's show is going to the Houston Food Bank. Now, yeah. I've never been to a food bank. I've been to a drive through bank. Is there a thing where, like, the drawer slides out and it's just filled with chili? And <laughs> you show up with your own ladle? <laughs> Are, are, do people come to you, or are you bringing it to everybody? So the food banks themselves are like distribution centers, so we don't actually serve people directly. We, we work with all these different charities, mostly right. like church pantries that are doing the distribution. Well, uh, not only is uh, the money that's been raised uh, here today all going to the uh, food bank, but I believe uh, Tom Castillo, who's the uh, manager here at the Houston Improv is going to uh, bring out a check, and I think we have a little matching funds situation. Tom, I don't know, Tom may be in the back firing employees right now. <laughs> I heard him yelling at uh, some folks. Uh, Tom, are you, is that you, Tom? Yeah, come on up, because uh, we have a presentation here for Brian. Oh, yes, we'll, we'll socially distance, but... 
It's, oh, uh, <laughs> this is a ceremonial check. Do not try to take this to a check cashing place and hammer this check, Brian. This is a ceremonial check. But yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Yeah. I just want to say, I want to thank, first of all, thank Adam, because what he's done this week is incredible. I don't know if you guys realize, but he's donating all, this, all his money that he's made this week to the staff and to the food bank, okay? And, you know, and, and so let's give it up for Adam. Um, not, not, I've been in a comedy business for 30 years. I'm actually the owner, and uh, the, you know, not a lot of guys like this, okay? You guys, I know you guys know him. He's your guy. Really appreciate that. What I also want to tell you guys is we're matching what Adam's raised. So I think the total donation for today is $20,000. And so let's, let's, let's give it up again. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, guys. And uh, Brian Green, Tom Castillo, you're doing the Lord's work. Thank you uh, very much, and thanks for what you do. It is true that all the money I'm raising uh, over this weekend is either going to the food bank or going to uh, the folks who work here, the guys in the kitchen, the folks uh, making the drinks and bringing the food. Uh, but I also got a haircut. <laughs> and it was a $9,000 haircut, and we have to back that out. So... <laughs> And I flew here privately, and I've had surf and turf for every meal. And again, we have to back that all out. So I'm going to need you to pass the hat so the servers could go ahead and contribute, because i got to be made whole before I leave. Thank you. You're all heroes. Uh, Dan Crenshaw. Oh, the book. Sorry. Fortitude. I'm looking for... Uh, I, I, have you guys read or listened to uh, Dan's book, uh, Fortitude? It is... It is all uh, you need, and it's all your kids' needs, and it's all America needs, and I'm a, a huge fan of this man. I saw him originally on Saturday Night Live, like many of you did, and I saw the way he handled that, and I just thought it was so graceful that you had a sense of humor uh, about being the butt of a joke and went on the show and showed that you could take a joke and then give some back, and... I, let, why don't you talk about the mindset to that approach? You wake up Sunday morning, you find out that some scrawny kid's been talking shit about you, and your first reaction is what? It's a good question. First of all, thanks everybody for being here and supporting the Houston Food Bank. Really appreciate that. And thank you for supporting Adam's private flights. It's these LA guys. They needed to come here. Welcome to Freedom. Oh my by God. The way. We're, uh, <laughs> It is. Uh, it, it was so weird the first night. I mean, after being in total lockdown, I mean, I've been living in a shark cage. L.A., <laughs> if you want to go outside your house, they cut out leg holes in a shark cage. You pick it up. You can walk about. It's like Hell Week. It's like yeah, you carrying the like raft in Coronado. You make it about 18 feet. You set it down. You're gassed yeah. out. Your yeah. teammates are yelling oh, at you. It's tough. Neighbors but, are tattling on you. We went out and had a steak and a martini on Thursday night, and I just couldn't believe it because it, it's like the greatest thing ever for me is I work really hard and then going out for a drink and a steak is, is the reward and of course in LA there is no carrot at the end of the stick yeah. <laughs> but they well, do have the stick yeah <laughs> they'll get you especially if you're surfing alone because there's nothing more dangerous than a lone surfer oh my out god there, you know given coronavirus to well I guess sharks I mean you brought up the shark cages uh, yeah. so um, to answer your question though uh the man, this happened so long ago. It's almost surreal to think about get, getting from there to here. And um, woke up the next day. Uh, I haven't watched Saturday Night Live live Saturday night since I was in high school. But it, but it was a staple of, of of a lot of us growing up. I used to watch it back before Netflix and TV and all that. Um, and uh, but the next day, I get all these text messages from from friends, and they're they're mostly making fun of me, like ah, they got you. You know, because right. it's the SEAL teams, right? These are, these are, these are the kind of people I'm, 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 I'm with. So they love watching me just get, just get raked over the coals. But they're also kind of pissed because mm -hmm. they get to rake me over the coals. They don't like it when it's like some skinny comedian does it. Um, and, uh, and, it and it was more annoying than anything else. It was, it was lost on me at the time. or I was not aware at the time of, of the significance of that event for my own life yet. 
It now, was, for, the, for those of you who don't know what happened, Pete Davidson was just showing, he was contributing to SNL's news, and he was just showing pictures of politicians, mostly Republicans, and then sort of making jokes at their expense. And they put up a picture of you and said you looked like a porn... A hitman in a porno. A hitman <laughs> in a porno movie. Well, that, that, and that wasn't the offensive part. That no. Was, that, that part makes you think. So you're like, what does that look like? It, there's a lot of questions that arise, that arise from that comment. That's not what made everybody mad. Um, what, what made everybody mad when, it's when, he, when, he said, when he kind of sort of apologized for it. I know, I'm sorry, he lost his eye in war or whatever. Uh, right. And he said it like that. Whatever. And it felt right. a little bit like an ad lib. It felt a little bit kind of like an accident, but, but it's kind of like he meant it. And it made everybody really mad. And so... The, the, way I, the way I analyze this situation in my book is I, I said there's, there was basically two ways this could have gone. And it was a perfect storm of events that allowed us to sort of make America feel good about it. And, but it could have gone much differently because what normally happens in that situation is we unleash the outrage mob. And we just unleash the Twitter mob and we'll, we'll get these guys. We'll get them good. Maybe we'll get them fired. Maybe we'll get them canceled. We'll get people to stop you know, advertising with them. And they were getting threats of that anyway, actually. And what would have happened? Well, Saturday Night Live probably would have backed into their corner. Maybe they would have profusely apologized. Maybe they would have just weathered the storm. Either way, nobody would feel really good about it. Uh, instead, well, the, the apology would have been coerced. It would have been right. like uh, Al-Qaeda, you know, had some CNN film crew denounce America because yeah. they captured them and some rat hole in Tikrit. So <laughs> I know that world, Dan. I'll explain it to you later after the show. <laughs> I've been in country. The point is, no, who wants to force the apology either? Like, that's unsatisfying. Right, but that's sort of what our culture forces. Right. It's what our culture expects these days, these sort of forced apologies. But it's it's not a real apology. Right. And the outrage mob never really subsides. They still hate you. They'll still try to cancel you. And, um, And so instead, we thought, okay, he clearly... They were clearly making jokes aimed at conservatives. It was right before the election. That was obvious. That bias was obvious. But it wasn't necessarily as obvious that they also hate wounded veterans. Okay, right. so, so maybe, we can, maybe we can, even though he said it, maybe we can give some benefit of the doubt. And, and, I, and I, I went back to a phrase that I, that I had gotten from a Harvard professor who was, I did my master's, just no big deal. It's the Texas A&M of the East, just to be clear. <laughs> And they started off the semester, and he says, while you're here, try hard not to offend others, and try even harder not to be offended. And I thought that was a really deep but simple way of putting it, given the atmosphere that we're in. And I think this professor was tapping into what we all understood to be true about college campuses these days. And that always stuck with me. Not much has stuck with me from that orientation, but that really stuck with me. And that's what I said. That was my statement at the time, and I thought it, was, I thought it balanced it just right. And because we gave them that benefit of the doubt, they, they brought me on, and I got to go on, and, and, and America felt pretty good about it. And I'll, have to, I'll, I'll say this, too. I don't talk about this in the book. I, don't, I should have, maybe, in hindsight, um, because it's a great compliment to myself. But <laughs> <laughs> Steven Spielberg was in the back uh, on, that, on that, not, that night, on that show. He was, um, I guess he was in town filming for something. The he, night he, he, you came the, the in night that I was there. So, he, yeah, they, they give him... It's a very small stage. I mean, honestly, it's not that much bigger than this. And um, they give him a little section on his own. He's got his cheese and crackers and wine and things. It's just for Steven Spielberg. And I got to talk to him after I did my set, and he, he gave me some pretty cool compliments. He said, you got great comedic timing. You're, you're even funnier than Adam Carolla. And... <laughs> You know, you, you could have a real future in Hollywood. And I was, I was like, that's awesome. But it was just me and him. There was nobody else listening. And I said, this is not good. I need, <laughs> I need witnesses. And my wife was uh, somewhere across the stage, right, watching, like, Halsey perform or something because she was the guest that night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, Tara, come over here. Tara, come over here. And uh, I said, Mr. Spielberg, could you just go ahead and say what you just said again? And it was really awkward. But I don't care because I got a witness. And my wife, who is here now, cannot deny that he did say this. I will say hi to my wife, Tara. I don't know where she's at, but there she is. And then Dan says to Spielberg, you should make a war movie one of these days. 
I love all the E.T. shit, but make something gritty, like World War II, like Normandy, storming the beach, you know, German uh, pillboxes and uh, machine guns. So, yeah, let's talk a little. Uh, I always think about, I think about war because I think more about the location <laughs> I mean, obviously, the parts where there are bullets flying and bad guys everywhere, that's a negative. But then there's also <laughs> the environment. Like, you see all those Vietnam Wars, and it's during t- t- torrential rain, monsoon season. Everyone's got, you know, leeches on the back of their neck, and they're, you know, they got the rot, the foot rot, and the mud, and the stuff, and they're sleeping on the ground with Charlie Sheen, and it's a disaster. <laughs> Then you see Saving Private Ryan and they're going through the rolling hills of the French countryside and you're like, well, you still got Germans shooting at you, but not too shabby other than that. You know what I mean? What are they complaining about? Yeah. Some of the places you've been, and maybe it's just because I don't like dust. I hate dust. It feels weird. I want to shower off. Talk And then the helicopter landings with all the dust flying everywhere. The, the dust is what gets you, right? Oh, yeah. my. It's, a, it's, it's brutal. Like you can deal with the IEDs to the face and everything, but what's the dust? It's the little thing. In your hair. Yeah. It, it is true. I you mean, know, after I heat? got blown up by the IED, that was one thing. But days later, there was still dust in my hair. Now we're talking. Now you're on my page. That's well, it's what I'm true. <laughs> So annoying. You ever see one of those camel spiders, one of those giant spiders, or a scorpion, or something good and deadly in the no. desert? What's the Honestly, hottest? No. What's the hottest it's been for you? Oh, it can get up. To, and I, I think Iraq was hotter than Afghanistan. At least it felt that way to me. I was also blown up in June. I was blown up in June, mm-hmm. so I, I left after that. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so I didn't. But, uh, I, wasn't, I think that, it gets a lot hotter in July and August. But June I, is not the blowing up season there. You want to get blown up <laughs> yeah. in April or yeah, May? Yeah, I mean, yeah, because it, it was getting it was getting warm. It was yeah. getting warm. But I, you know, but it, you're, you're looking at 130, 140 degrees in Iraq. Though we always operated at night, so it's only like 115 degrees at night. <laughs> it's, it's so and, miserable. And I mean, you're you're <laughs> like, carrying fifty pounds. I mean, you're yeah. all. I mean, you got the flak yeah. jackets on, helmets, yeah. pant, water, provisions. I mean, so not only, like you know. <clears throat> now look, this may sound gay, but I fight in a speedo. <laughs> you could argue it may be the straightest endeavor of all time, but um, you're packed up. I mean, you're, you're, you're layered and it's 115 degrees outside, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just kind of learn to deal with it. It's, it's just uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, especially with the dust, as you yeah. mentioned. Well, that's you know, in the, the dust, it gets in your teeth, in your eyes. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, there are some places in Afghanistan that really are unbelievably beautiful. So it depends. We, we, were, we operated in Kandahar province mostly. About the, the southern area, that's the, this desert kind of moon dusty place that you're talking about. You go a little bit north, though, you're in these beautiful mountains. You're seeing these rivers come through it. Like, we're, you know, we're, we're in the wintertime, we were trudging through three feet of snow with these crazy mountains that you've just never seen anything like it. It's unbelievably beautiful. So it's, it's I mean, we, would, we would think, like, wow, we, could, we should start some adventure, like, tourism company You here. need a zip line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> zip line? No, you don't. Let's forget the zip line, man. You're, you know, you, you, you can take all these rich folks out. There's, there's a Taliban shooting at you. It's, it's exciting. You oh, can river raft. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The ultimate tough mutter. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is a tough yeah. mutter fucker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, you and your rich buddies can drive your Range Rover to the park and crawl on your elbows through some mud some guy hit with a hose. But have you been shot at you been with shot a at? Soviet rocket-propelled grenade? Right. They're not that accurate. They're not they're That's not what that I'm accurate. saying. It's, it's, the, the IEDs are much more worrisome. Mm. Yeah, because you never know where they're going to put these things. And um, I write about these things in my book because they're, they're random. You know, we, we were on this one mission where there was... It was truly out in the middle of nowhere. And, um, Improvised explosive devices. Right, right, right. right. Um, as, as opposed to an IUD, which is... A, <laughs> That's <there's> different. <laughs> <laughs> My wife has a funny story about that. We have friends who would be like, Dan got hit by an IUD. <laughs> That's how he lost his eye. It's just, ah, it's the wrong... That's inner, not the right acronym. Inner uteral... <laughs> 
Do, we don't have to. Okay, we don't they, have they to know. do it. Device, <laughs> just in case. Okay. But, uh, you know, a couple of buddies of mine, they, they actually sat on the just top of this random hilltop. Now, I guess it's not that random. There's a reason they sat there. There's a good view. It's a good, it's a good fire position to take up while people are moving through the village below. It's a good point. And I guess, I guess Taliban, who had been there in the past, also knew it was a good point. And they sit down, and they hear this, like, clack. And it's a small explosion, not a big one. Because any, any detonation needs to be set off by a smaller detonation, mm-hmm. just, just generally how explosives work. And they set off the smaller detonation, but it didn't set off the main charge, thank God, because there was about 15 pounds of extra main charge there that could have killed them um, instead of just spooked them. It's, just, it's crazy where they put these things. They're everywhere. And it's, uh, they make them. Do they make them on the spot? Like, do they make them... You know, are, are these locally sourced, locally harvested, free range yeah. Yeah, there's <laughs> explosive a big, there's a big devices? Made, made in Afghanistan movement. <laughs> well, are they farming them out to some Chinese factory, or are they yeah. all kind of making them at you know on the spot, like a farmers market? It's more of a yeah. It's very, very locally or, very sourced. Organic. Yeah, you, yeah. You want to locally source this stuff because you know, just like made in the USA movement here, they've got that. The Taliban have that as well in um, in Afghanistan. So they. They, we call them little factories, but really they're just abandoned buildings, and they get in there. And these are very simple. So these are fertilizer compounds. They just put in there maybe 15 pounds of that. That's the explosive part. Um, some wires, some batteries, and some just wood panels. That's really all you need. It's, it, it's Can you imagine easy. that uh, the factory that makes the uh, IEDs, like, you know that sign they have up days since last accident? <laughs> There must be a guy who never even gets off the A-frame ladder. Like, come on, Habib, get down. No, it's a waste of time. As soon as I get down, I got to go right back up again. They they have higher labor standards than you might think. Really? Yeah. Is OSHA involved at all? OSHA. It's a a Taliban OSHA. They're very concerned about their safety. They bury them in the ground, but they're remotely Set detonated often. Depends. Is that sometimes, Depends. sometimes it's much easier to have them pressure plates. Right. So, yeah. So because all you need to do is basically have two wood panels wrapped in wire. When those two wires hit each other, it, it completes the circuit and blows it up. Um, a remote, if if it's command detonated, means mm-hmm. there's a wire moving somewhere. That's much more dangerous for them because they have to be. We, in yeah, yeah. I mean, they've got to be able to run away, or they got to be able to watch us. Um, they they much prefer the the you know the the pressure plates. The one that uh, got you was one that your translator stepped on just in right. front of you, right? Right, right. If and I had stepped on it, I'd, you know, I would have lost both my legs easily. He, he lost all... He lost all Both legs, limbs, both arms? Both arms, yeah. He was a um, smaller guy, so he was... Uh, it was how, a, how far physically was he in front of you? Pr- probably right here, probably this distance. Why'd I you think? have to jinx me, dude? Yeah, well... <laughs> Couldn't have specked out that guy. Hopefully. The point to me now, I'm going to step on something later. Well, you never know. You never know. You never All right. know. So about five, six feet. Yeah. So you guys were socially distancing. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a. And you he, know what's funny? Can we, so the the six foot rule has long been known to seals, and mm. this is why, because. Bud students, so buds is, is SEAL training, right? It's the first six months. It's the crucible that we all go through. Basic Bas- underwater demolition. Slash SEAL training, yes. Right. And so that's, that's hell week. That's all that. And instructors always, there's a rule that students always have to stay six feet away from instructors. Mm. And the reason is, is because students are gross. They're right. always, yeah, they are. They're gross. And um, they're covered in bacteria. They're going in and out of the ocean. The, the ocean is not that clean in Southern California because Tijuana is always dumping crap into it. It's a, it's a, it's a I bad get deal. it, Republicans. Blame Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. Crenshaw. You got your crowd here. <laughs> but I want to tell you, my nanny, my gardener, my pool man, all from Mexico. So when I'm yelling at them what to do, I have a certain respect. Oh, Jesus. Anyway. <laughs> There's a lot of bacteria in the ocean. <laughs> Because, not of, from because Germany, of Hollywood. Not from Sweden. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. 
And so you're covered in this stuff, and it does spread disease. Like mm-hmm. it's, well, it makes people sick. It's not like disease, but it right. makes people sick. And instructors are, you know, they, they don't want any of that on them. And so you're always yelling at bud students who are always running around the compound. And sometimes instructors will actually get close to students just to be like, six feet! Right. Yeah, oh. just like, get away. And the students like, oh, I'm so sorry. And so we've long known the social distancing rule on patrol. You've got to be six feet, or way more than six feet, actually, because you don't want to be all bundled up and get hit with a rocket-propelled grenade. But when you're talking about, in the book, going on patrol, and you're talking about in an area where there may be IEDs, which is everywhere, you guys actually walk in a line together to obviously literally minimize your footprint on, on that road, which obviously then makes... It's a more dangerous configuration for combat. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not a good tactical formation. Um, if, if, if you want to be in a firefight with somebody, you want to be spread out. You want to have different maneuvering elements, the base of fire maneuvering element. But it's not that complicated. But a line isn't so great. You, you only go in a line um, if, you, if you, you know, maybe you're going a long distance. We might, but even then, we want to be staggered. Right. But we have to go on a line because one line is cleared, and you and you want to make sure you stay on that line. And uh, yeah, that's just, that's just what you do. So your interpreter is about six feet in front of you. He steps on this uh, IED. It kills him, although not instantly. No, not instantly. Yeah. Uh, but he's very severely wounded, and then you get hit sort of sort of everywhere, right? Yeah. It, it, you know, I was in this position, um, and all of a sudden I wasn't. And I don't, I, don't, I don't believe I lost consciousness. If I did, it was only a, a split second. But it, just, it, it, feel, it feels like you got hit with a truck, and a lot of people in that truck shot you with a shotgun and then poured Tabasco sauce all over you. Wow. That's sort of, that's sort of what getting... Because I was, I was hit with the concussion of it, but it was, it was mostly a fragmentation wound. So like, just from top to bottom. And they put all sorts of nasty stuff in there to cause... They did, yeah, because, I mean, we were pulling bolts out of my hands. Um, bolts. Yeah, like bolts and screws and things. And th- those aren't necessarily part of an IED. They probably added those things. Let me tell you something about the bolts. I bet they were metric. Now, I like working yeah. on cars. <laughs> Standards Communist SAE. Bolts. That's made in America, my friend. Right. You did not right. pull out any 3 eighths, half inch, or 9 sixteenths. That shit was 7 millimeter, 9 millimeter. It's what the rest of the world uses to blow us up. And that ain't American made. No, that much not. I'll tell you right now. Well, you know what they say. There's two types of countries. Mm. The ones that have won two world wars back to back and the kinds with a metric system. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, you, you remain conscious this entire time, at yep. least to the best of your knowledge. Right. You, you, know, you know it's bad, but you, you don't know how bad it is, right? No, I, do. I mean, I know, I'm, I, know I have my legs. The, the first thing I did was check my legs, and I had those. And so mm-hmm. that's a good thing. Um, I couldn't see. I, I never for a second assumed that my eyes were damaged. There's, I don't know why I didn't assume that. I just didn't. And I just assumed there was dirt in them. It was, it was, it was a bit of... Um, self-deception a very healthy self-deception honestly in hindsight and that self-deception would continue for weeks frankly um you know with changing from okay i'm not even hurt to okay i'm hurt but i'm easily going to see again even though the doctors really did not think i would ever see again and so i I remember very vividly the actual experience i remember talking to uh my good friend a medic who come came over wrapped me up here wrapped me up there i complained about stomach pain that was where the, the hardest hit seemed to be. I, felt, I thought I had shrapnel shooting through my abdomen. It turned out not to be the case. I mean, it was badly peppered, but it was the, no, nothing went that deep. I mean, the worst wounds were just down here because that was the closest to the bomb. Um, my face did, did not look good. I have very few pictures from this whole thing, but I do have a picture a week later, I mean, at, well after, words and uh my face does, does it looks like i got shot in the face with a shotgun that that's that's basically what it looks like and the rest of my body looks the same um but for the most part uh i was able to actually get up by the end of it and just you know and, and walk to the helo it's and called a helo not a chopper only arnold schwarzenegger calls it a chopper Ooh. we should just we, we always have to remind people of that well what is a chopper is anything a chopper well um, a motorcycle's a chopper uh, yeah but not a helo technically no 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 
If, if, if anybody in the military ever says, hey, the chopper's here, everybody will make fun of them and say, oh, get to the chopper. That's what they'll say. Right. <laughs> Just so you know. So, like, every military movie... See, here's the thing. I don't know much about the military, but I am a journeyman carpenter. <laughs> so, every time I watch a movie where the hero is a carpenter, I go, oh, that's so fake. Look at him. He's using a waffle-ended framing hammer when he should be using a finish hammer. Or, you know those movies like where they grab the framing gun and you hold it at the bad guy and they fire, you know, Mel Gibson fires it. I'm like, the compressor's not even on. Come on. And you got to pull the safety back at the end. You know, it's spring-loaded. Fake. Oh, but every fifth movie is a military movie. See, for me, the carpentry movies are few and far between, but the yeah. military movies yeah. are every other weekend, and they're all ruined for you because they're calling the shit. Uh, they're getting a job. lot better. They're getting a lot better. Uh, you know, all of these, there's a lot of SEAL movies that got made post Bin Laden raid. They were all a little too good in, in, in a lot of cases where you're thinking, you know, you're kind of giving away a little too much. Here. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, you know what else I hate though is you know when and this still happens no matter what um, where every time somebody points and, th- and everybody will understand this because we're in Texas and everybody's a gun owner or at least should be yeah. Yeah. but when you draw your weapon it doesn't make the slide action sound that drives you know? me nuts like, it doesn't it and, and when you're nuts. really serious and when you're really serious then it makes a, another or maybe they cock it or something yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. it's like that's just not no, that's not what you do I'm a, <laughs> it's not, it's, I'm a carpenter not a gun guy but that drives me insane just because you point it doesn't mean it's going to make another right, noise no, no, I'm really serious also I do like <laughs> the one where they get about halfway into the warehouse and then at some point the guy goes Ch-ch-ch. it's like hey do that in the parking lot Come in prepared. Yes. Come, come in prepared. You, you run through half a dark warehouse, if, and if now we, you're doing this? Yeah. If, if, if you were in a platoon and you heard a guy, like, rack it, right. you know, in the middle, you'd be like, what? Were you not ready? <laughs> yes. Like, five minutes? We started five minutes ago. Like, what are you doing? And it's not like racking... The weapon is like one of those weird spring load timers in a sauna at a bad hotel where, like, yeah. you have to do it again, right? No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. doesn't work that way. It's crazy. <laughs> the, one that's e- the one that's equally as bad as the uh, every time I hold the gun, it makes a new noise one. Yeah. That drives me insane. But what drives me more insane is when the guy's, like, wearing his toga and he pulls the knife out of his underpants and it goes, shing. <laughs> it's like, like, you don't do that? Where's the shing coming <laughs> oh, yeah, from? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Hey, where'd that sound come from? Yeah. Well, that's true. Turns out movies are I've fake. Been- yeah. <laughs> I've actually, I've, I've tried to make them make that sound. It doesn't. You're right. Doesn't it's make very, that sound. It's very disappointing. So uh, I was thinking about you. I actually had a dream you about were. you. I, okay. I did. Yeah. This it is was, getting. It wasn't that gay. Weird. It was kind of bi. Really, that's what it was. It was wasn't was straight. I wearing a I'm not going to say it was straight. <laughs> but I was. I was thinking, what is underneath your patch? Do you have mm. a glass eye? Do oh, you, yeah. Is it? Just kept there? I've got a lot of glass eyes. So today, um, I, I usually wear the trident tie. Wow. Yeah. What is you that? Have you seen that? It's the seal trident. Oh, the seal trident. Yeah. Wow. And so it's actually a, a 24 karat gold earring that is, that is implanted into the prosthetic in this case. Uh, but I have like 12 of these things. And do you have any uh, like sponsorships like Pepsi, <laughs> UPS? It's a really good idea. Gatorade. I mean, it's come really on, man. The- You're leaving money on the table. It's true. There's so much on the table. Uh, the, I, I've got a bunch of different ones. I've unveiled a few of them. I've got um, one of them recently was the Gonzalez flag. So the come and take it flag. You've seen that. It's What's a bit the of Gonzalez flag? The Gonzalez flag is the, it's the come and take it flag. Ah. 
where we have the cannon. If you've seen that, it says the cannon, and then it says come and take it. And it, oh. it's from the Battle of Gonzales, with the start of the revolution, we, we have Texas like, Revolution. We have one in California that says, please tread on me. <laughs> and it's a, it's a cockroach crying. It's a cockroach crying. Ah. And there's this huge boot worn by Gavin Newsom, and it's like that. It's, we, we, unf- we bring please it out on Veterans Day. Please tell me exactly what to do to stay safe. <laughs> That's right. Oh, it's ridiculous. So you have so, one for that. Yeah, we got that one. And, um, you know, the reason I wear the patch is, well, because, I mean, you can't tell what that is, like, even from this distance. So it's always an awkward kind of public thing to have the, 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 the prosthetic eyes without the patch. The patch tells the story right away. So it's kind of like my public private life and also a little bit of a formal informal wear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do so you have all the different glass eyes and, uh, you know, stop me if it gets too personal. But I, I was thinking about it, like... And dreaming about well, it, yeah, <laughs> You know, like, my son has a retainer he puts in his mouth. Does it kind of pop it's actually, in and yeah, pop it's actually out? very similar to, a, to, to what... Yeah, it's very similar to that, actually. Because so a lot of people think it's like a ball, you know, mm-hmm. because you watch Pirates of the Caribbean and the, the, the eye rolls down the deck and... And he's like, oh, and put that back in there, and it's made of wood, which really doesn't make any sense because the splintering would just be um, terrible. But uh, the, you couldn't really do a so- you couldn't do that. It, they, they, they put a, a permanent, I think, spherical object in there. They wrap the muscle around it. Uh-huh. And then it's so, if I took it out, it would, it would kind of just look like, yeah, like you're under your lips. That's sort of what it would look like, like your gums. And you just slip it in there. It's like, a, it's like shaped like this. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I can like- take it out, I can throw it at people. It's shaped like a homecoming queen is waving to her gallery. And exactly. And when you go to the airport, do they, they want to take a peek under there? They, <laughs> um, no, well, I rarely, yeah, sometimes, yeah. I mean, well, it's a good question. How do they uh, react? They don't really react. They're very polite. TSA is very polite. They've also gotten to know me by now. I'm flying so much. Really? And uh, so what is, what is, uh, and you know, I just think, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Dan. I, 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 I just sort of on to him recently, but I first got on to you on SNL. And then when the book came out, I was like listening to the book and I thought, this is first politician I've really heard just talking straight pragmatism, just nuts and bolts. Here's how life works. No shortcuts. As uh, one of your uh, buds instructors would say, your last easy day was yesterday, right? right. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and really all the stuff that's been around stoicism, the way to raise a family, the way to conduct yourself, pride and dignity and a sense of community. And for some reason, so many politicians have just drifted away from that because I think it's just easier to kind of feed the kids the sugary empty calorie cereal for breakfast and not be hassled by something that's actually nutritious and good for them. So I think the politicians have, are almost just sadly taking the cue from the constituency who doesn't really want to get up and do the work that needs to be done. But I'm hoping that in the right vessel meaning you, that these messages, these tried and true messages could return. I have a, I, because they're the only things that work. Well, and, and that's how I... Thank you. Why aren't you clapping, sir? Do you disagree with my pregnancy? There you go. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I, I like to describe my political philosophy that way. I'm, I'm a, my political philosophy is conservative, and and it's it's for fundamentally, it's things that work. It's things that have worked for a very long time. They don't always feel good. It's it's not always it, does, it doesn't always feel like the the most compassionate thing to say, but it is the right thing to say. And w- whether whether it's about our limiting principles, whether it's about the way we should govern, whether it's about the way we should treat people in our society. And it, just the way you would treat your own kids. You teach your kids that they're accountable. You teach their kids that their actions matter. You teach your kids that if they work hard, they'll get this. Uh, you teach your kids about fairness and sharing and how to treat others. And it, would, it strikes me as odd that some people would treat their kids that way because they love them. It doesn't matter yes. if they're liberal or conservative. But they wouldn't treat the American people that way. 
and you would treat them totally differently. You would tell them that they're victims. You would tell them that, that they don't have control over their lives, that they're not accountable. And that seems very odd to me, and I think we should, we should actually treat the American people like we love them. Yes, like you love them. Right. I know it, that is the ultimate love. Being nice is not love. That is, that is not love. It being Love is what you do with your kids. I, I, always, I always sort of look at it this way. So many of these politicians that are talking about, uh, well, a lot of people can't get IDs, or they don't have access to checking accounts, or they don't have access to IDs, and they can't vote. I'd go, what if your 17-year-old son announced that he couldn't travel with you to go on a family vacation to Maui because he didn't have access to an ID or he didn't have access to a check out. What would your answer be to that child? If the answer is, what are you talking about? March yourself down to the bank let's, or let's do it online an ID. <laughs> and ju- get yourself an ID. Well, then if that's your answer for your child, then that's the answer for society. Yeah. Hold on. Why aren't you clap? Okay, good. Well, I'm going to be watching you. That's one of the more ridiculous arguments, isn't it? Like, well, a lot of people don't have IDs. First of all, I, you know, to, to say that a bunch of minorities don't have IDs, I, that's racist, first of all. Of course all. You're, it's you're, racist. You're, you're, you're telling these people that they don't have IDs, and, and by the way, you go and ask them, they're like, of course we have IDs. What are you, what are you talking about? Well, also, <laughs> also, you know, where I'm sort of coming from is if you are the politician and you are saying... There's a lot of people that don't have access to IDs. First off, I don't like the word access. It's this notion of like, well, Hobby Lobby's denying their employees access to birth control. That's not denying you access to birth control. That's not supplying you with birth control. Hobby Lobby doesn't make you a sandwich for lunch either. That's them... (laughs) Not them denying you lunch. It's them not giving you a PLT. Yeah, it's a difference. That's, why aren't you clapping? No. <laughs> so <laughs> enough with the denied access. It drives me yeah, insane. No, Anyone can get an ID. Now, it may be more difficult for some than others. So if I'm talking to a politician and the politician says many people don't have access to IDs, I'm going to say, well, then where is your bookmobile that got converted to the ID mobile, which has DMV employees, and you can go to these underserved neighborhoods, and you can let's sign go. people let's, up, let's solve that problem. and you will solve that problem. Right. But they yeah. never go that route. No, no, they just announce there's a problem because minus the solving. Because an ID is important for so many things. And so if, if you actually believed that certain underserved communities didn't have access to IDs, you would think that the that the solution there would be to get them access to IDs because it's not just voting that we would want them to have IDs for. It's, well, I don't know, life, right? Because yes. that's just what you need in life. And so if, if people don't have an ID, it tells me that they're, they're, they are probably truly underserved and probably need some help, so let's get them IDs. Well, doesn't the, mean you don't change, it doesn't mean you change election laws well, as a result. Yes, I, if you in this uh, modern era do not possess an ID as an adult, then you're not a functioning member of our society. It is, it is impossible to function. So if I say these people need to vote, we should do it without IDs, well, that doesn't really solve any problems. All it does is lessen the barrier to vote. But once they voted, they're still now living a life that's ID-less. And if you're a politician and your real job is to get these people not to be disenfranchised, but to join society, pay their taxes, be able to travel and all the things that go along with having an ID, if you were a sincere person, which I don't think you are, but if you were actually sincere, you would want to get them those IDs, not, not lower the uh, barrier for voting. Exactly. This is, this, is one, this is one of the only things that my Democrat colleagues want to, want to, want to deregulate. Right. They want to overregulate literally everything else, but not this one. And I, and I find that strange. Voting. And it, and it, voting. And it, right. And it, what else is strange is, is this, this need to, or this, 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 this idea that we should mail everybody their ballot and do mail-in ballots because of coronavirus. Here's the thing. Okay, what takes less human interaction? Going to the grocery store 
or voting. Okay, so at the grocery store, you pick up all your things with your hands, then you put them on this little conveyor belt. Somebody else touches that thing with their hands, gives it to somebody else who touches it with their hands, puts it in a bag, gives it back to you, which you take home and you put in your mouth. I'm never <laughs> going to another grocery store, by the way. I don't know where you're heading with this, but yeah. you've ruined the shopping experience for this podcast there. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> no, of course. Yeah, of course. If you can do and that. Like, in voting, it's like, okay, you go in, you look at somebody, they check your ID, at least in Texas they do, and then you go touch a machine. Right. That's it. That's hey, we, it. We can do that. Okay. I, I agree. Like, it's not, come on. I had, uh, I, was, I was thinking about you. Well, I was only dreaming about you, yeah. but I was, I was thinking about Happening something. <laughs> But it's a, it's a kind of unintended circumstance. So I'm at, uh, I'm at the hotel. We did a, I did a show here last night. We got out of here about 10 o'clock. We went to, uh, what's the local steak place? Uh, God, Papa's? Whatever. Yeah, went there. Oh, freedom, baby. Had uh, surf and turf, a couple martinis. Got back to the room at, you know, 1230 at night. And uh, this morning, I was kind of sleeping in a little. I got to do a show later tonight. And all I could hear all morning was people pulling their doors open and letting them go with the self-closer, with the pneumatic closer, you know, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. So it's like the room to this side of me, the room to that side of me, and they fling the door open. It's got the pneumatic closer, and it's like chunk-chunk. Like, we all know that sort of concussion of the door shutting on the metal frame because people are going in and out at 7.30 in the morning or 8 in the morning. And I thought to myself, why do we need that pneumatic closer? And the reason we need that pneumatic closer is for fire reasons, because a fire would not spread nearly as quickly if all the doors are closed. But then I thought to myself, who leaves their hotel room and forgets to close their door? Couldn't we trust... I've, I've done that. You've done it? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah you're, you're so responsible. <laughs> <laughs> I am saying if you, go, if you go to an old hotel in France, they do not have the pneumatic closer. You have to do it yourself. But here's a slippery slope. The more stuff that kind of gets done for you where you just don't have to think about it, like yeah. the more, you know, every car's an automatic now and it all kind of parallel parks and everything and every door is shut for you by the man. Maybe you start getting a little softer. Like maybe you start tuning out. We're very I do, soft. You, We're very soft. What, I, go ahead. You go ahead. I'll go ahead. <laughs> no, so, I'm no, saying it's a, like it's a when you drive a car, when you had, well, you told me to go. <laughs> You, if you drive a car with a stick shift, you are engaged yeah. in, in that car. Like, you, you, when you drove an old car, you kind of had to be yeah. responsible. There was no texting and kind of drifting off now. And I yeah. worry that everything is kind of being done for every, everything's in and the government as well, and we're kind of drifting off. We're, and we're expecting more of it, you know? We're expecting somebody to take care of us. This is... This is through and through been noted in the coronavirus pandemic and watching not just the United States, but the world react to this. This notion that, that we, we can't even make decisions for ourselves. That, right. that, that if we feel unsafe, we should also tell other people that they should feel unsafe and that they shouldn't be able to go out. It's very strange. This very, very strange notion that if, that if our governor says, hey, we're going to allow people to go back to work and allow them to do this, that, that he would get criticized as, as dumb and and uh, weak. Uh, that was from Beto today. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting um, Beto on this one. And I, oh yeah, I'm in a big fight. I'm in a big Twitter fight with Beto today. <laughs> and uh, it, it, was, it was so interesting. And I'm like, what, what I said was this. I said, you're actually calling all Texans dumb and weak. Because Governor Abbott is not forced. Did, did Governor Abbott force anybody here? Am I aware? <laughs> Okay, I was just making sure. Did you guys get a letter from the governor that said you had to come here and put yourselves in, in, at potential risk? You're always risking your life when you leave, leave the house, no matter what. But he didn't make you do it. You chose to do it. And there's, there's an element of freedom there. There's an element of personal responsibility. I think we're a little bit more inclined to think of, think of it that way in Texas than maybe in some other parts of the country. Um, but the whole world has done this. The first time in human history 
First time in human history we've collectively really shut down this way, and it's interesting, and I hope we analyze it thoughtfully in hindsight and think about what we did right and what we did wrong, because we really have lost perspective. We yeah. really have, and, and you know, about what is difficult, and you know, and I, I talk about my book, I'm like, I have ancestors that came, I'm a sixth generation Texan, my ancestors are coming to Texas, um, this, this uh, Sarah Howard was my first ancestor in Texas, she came here, she was kidnapped, her child was killed in front of her, she lost one husband, then lost another husband. You know, they, they had to find water every day. And, and like, where it, do you find water every day in Texas? And it was so much... In the summer. It's so not much, that easy. It was a, so <laughs> like, much dustier back oh, then geez. than it is now. No, because you're, oh, you, we you're, have you're asphalt. You're thinking of the Old West movies where there's it was dust dusty. everywhere. <laughs> well, and she lost her kids, but I'm saying, but, but the dust, that, it didn't help. It's not that dusty here. It was so dusty back then. It's very swampy in Houston. I don't need a wet nap. I feel like there's dust on this. You're thinking of like like the Wild West of Arizona. There's always tumbleweeds and and dust. And, you know, some of us have peanut peanut fever allergies. They think we ride horses to work. Which we should. Why don't we? You're uh, so sorry. Sarah, (laughs) your great, great ancestor. Right. Right, right. And then what do we complain about? I get really pissed when I'm like flying. I'm barreling through the air at 30,000 miles per hour and the Wi-Fi's not working. And I'm like, my life is hard. <laughs> this isn't fair. I'm oppressed. I'm no, <laughs> I'm no military pilot, but you're probably not at 30,000 miles an hour. 30,000 feet. 30,000 feet. Right, right. <laughs> He's broken no the sign. speed of light. <laughs> That Southwest flight got from <laughs> Texas oh. to Burbank in oh, 18 God. seconds. Washington Post. Washington Post is going to fact check me. <laughs> no, I knew you meant 30,000 feet at, uh, you know, 500 yeah. knots or yeah. so. I knew what you it's meant. Special but... government plane. You don't know about it. <laughs> well, nowadays, man, I don't know if you've seen some of that footage on Tucker Carlson. Man. Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we didn't. Even, America didn't even notice that there's UFOs now. I it, it's I crazy. didn't even notice. Well, here's my theory about UFOs. Our my, my theory is like we thought they were being hidden from us, so we wanted to know. Yeah. It's like we have the same relationship with uh, UFOs as we had for, with uh, Lance Bass, the singer from the boy band. We're like, I think that guy's gay, but he says he has a girlfriend. <laughs> And it bugged the shit out of us. And then at some point, he went, I'm gay. And we went, I knew it. And when we left. And nobody cared anymore. But that's what we yeah. did with UFOs. No, that's a perfect analogy. That's why, I'm, that's why I get yeah. the big box. So, but I mean, but this was incredible. I mean, this is, the, the, there's Navy footage of, of these of objects. There was a lot of analysis done. Have you ever heard the Joe Rogan podcast with the pilot? Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, so it's not new news. So the, the last couple of months weren't the first time it came out. I think, I think the, the Navy just declassified it officially. But it had long been out. And they didn't even try to hide it. You right. Know, and, because they knew it was foolish to try and hide it. And, you know, you, you hear this guy on the Joe Rogan show, and I really recommend this episode. Is, I, don't, I don't know how to find it. He just put so many episodes out. But it's really interesting. It goes in real detail about how they how they analyzed this object, you know, how many sensors they had on it, how they were filming it, what it looked like to them, why there was no rotor wash, there was no heat signature, very strange. All of it was very strange, and everybody's just like, yeah, but I mean, well, Tiger King's on, so... Uh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's crazy that we've turned the page that fast, and my entire childhood was sort of based on there's UFOs, they're out yeah. there, every third movie was a UFO movie, and now... Evidently, they're here, and we have no thoughts about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, just no thoughts. But if they're listening, and there are new overlords, <laughs> you guys are going to need entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, he pushes a pencil all day. You need someone with carpentry skills. <laughs> you need someone who can spread your message. Through entertainment, through comedy, I, again, I don't know if I assume you're listening, and there's going to be a few of us who you will spare because you will need us to help work on the others, much like what Gavin Newsom is doing to California right now. <laughs> you're going to need somebody who's doing it. Yeah, they're out there. That's crazy. That's crazy. I'm, so, I'm excited about it, though. I'm I don't think they need carpenters. Like, I don't think you're as important to them as you might. 
Well, they have, they have little Tic Tac spaceships that don't have any rotor wash that can move like 30,000 miles an hour. Actually, right. but everyone See, had a slip of the tongue. Maybe yeah, everyone needs it. countertops. Everyone needs storage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at some point, the aperture door for the spaceship is going to jam, and you, someone's going to have to squirt some WD forty on that bad boy. And I'm just saying, I'm your man. Do you do you carpenter? Is that how do you verb carpenter? Is it do, do you do you do wood making? Yeah, I'm not, I, occasionally, I wasn't, like know, as a I wasn't a, a I wasn't a wood worker, but I was a carpenter, so I did it for a so, living. Yeah, so you did it. In your, yeah, I mean, I know you did it before, but do you still do it? Do you still? Oh yeah, like, yeah. Makes, always work on uh, projects. Always working on projects at my own house. I have warehouses with cars in them. Constantly nice. building studios, and I built my oh, studio. Wow back in uh, L.A. and all that kind of stuff, and now i got to rip everything out of the ground and drag it to Texas. Yeah, we uh, set it up again. Um, so, uh, well, the way we're going to do this tonight is uh, I was going to bring Dan out and talk to him for about an hour and then do 20 minutes of uh, Adam Carolla's uh, Unprepared. And in between... We have a couple of songs from a uh, couple of artists who I enjoy, who uh, guys I've enjoyed since I was a kid. Of Graham Parker and John Hyatt are a couple of guys. And they, they recorded songs and then sent them here just to, just to be played for you guys tonight, tonight. And they just did it for us. So I think what we should do is give uh, Dan Crenshaw a hand. Um, I, I could do I could do this for another hour, buddy. So nice job. Thank you, everybody. Great to see y'all. Thank you for supporting the Houston Food Bank. Fortitude is the name of the book. American resilience in the era of outrage. So uh, thanks, Dan. I'll see you backstage, buddy. Uh, you guys, you guys, you guys. Who the. You guys get your uh, one word, one word for me to do uh, Adam Carolla's uh, Unprepared. Ready? Hold on. We're going to roll in about six minutes of uh, some custom songs that were done uh, for us tonight. And then when we come out of that, we will resume that portion of the show. Okay, Max Zapata? Here we Hello, go. Adam. Thank you for inviting me. This is Graham Parker coming from London, and I remember you like the... Up Escalator record. I know you said that, so this one is for you, mate.
be well and safe. Three, four. Gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Adam Corolla! All right, so uh, you guys throw out one word, raise your hand when you have it, and I will build a comedy routine around it. Right up here. Schmegma. There's a whole family of young Christian girls sitting right here. You're eating French fries with ranch. I just feel it's a daytime audience. We got a uh, veteran who was uh, covered with dust, you know, last time he was in country. I don't feel it's appropriate. You give me one, ma'am. Who had their hand up over here? Something PG, maybe 13. What is that? Baseball? Okay. Wait, what about the part where you raise your hand and then I point it at you? All right. This guy's got his hand up. Snapper? Like a long snapper? 
could be a snapper, could be a red snapper, could be a long snapper, could be a uh, lawnmower. I think they make a, quite, a, quite a lawnmower, snapper does, could be a snapping turtle. I got to say this, I was a long snapper in high school, and our team punted a lot. <laughs> The only thing I was proud of is not screwing up that, uh, that long snap in high school. But I can tell you that I always thought if you were in the mafia, and don't raise your hand, but you know who you are. <laughs> if you're even associated loosely with the mafia, you should pay off the long snapper on the next Super Bowl. He's the lowest paid guy on the team. He's getting the league minimum you give him $100,000, you get one over the punter's head, you get one that he skips back during a field goal attempt, you've shaved 10 points, and it costs you hundred grand. People, use your head. And somebody needs to make a movie called The Long Snapper, where they, they kidnap his teenage daughter. He's a grizzled veteran. He's been in the league for 14 years. This is his last year. His team goes to the Super Bowl, but they, they kidnap his daughter, and they're going to throw her in a well if he doesn't snap the ball over the punter's head. And then at some point, he snaps it with such velocity that he hits the bad guy in the head, and the gun goes off, and that's as far as I've got. Do you know that there are camps you can send your kid to, to who can for snapping now? There's like yes. specialty snapping classes. What's going on, man? My parents would go, here's a ball of foil. Get the fuck out of the house for two days. <laughs> now it's like, I'm going to pay this guy 80 bucks an hour, and he's going to show you how to snap a ball? What the hell? These kids are getting too specialized, by the way. What happened to, like, when you'd say to a kid, like, remember when I was a kid and someone would go to me, what are you good at? I'd go, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't have gone this thing. I wouldn't go snapping and the cello, and I'm working on an engineering degree. But, of course, I speak Mandarin as well. <laughs> I was good at drinking from the hose... And getting dudes in headlocks. That's what I was good at. Oh, and eating other people's food and then positioning it so they didn't know I'd pilfered half their corn nuts, you know? Like, there's a whole science, like a whole feng shui, like a whole snack feng shui where you'd go into your friend's you go into their kitchen, you'd go into their pantry and be like, okay, don't load up on honey roasted cashews. They'll know it. Take a handful of cashews, turn the label toward Mecca, make sure everything is working right, have a couple of space stick bars, have one hit off the chocolate milk, and then right back in the fridge. Don't get greedy. <laughs> to figure out just how much of this kid's food I could eat before his dad was on to me. All right, what else do we got? Wait, baseball. I, all right, I shouldn't be doing it. Who raised their hand with baseball? Okay, ba I'm just going to do baseball because someone keeps yelling baseball. That's the only good thing to come from this coronavirus is they've pushed the baseball season back. And may, we may only get in like 140 games. Yeah. Hey, baseball, you know what the best sport in the world is? Football. They both got the word ball in it. They go 16 games, they've tacked on a 17th, and everyone's pitching a fit. You guys play 17 games the first weekend. And I also like that they had to enact some rules, like, hey, no more eating in the dugout during this whole corona thing. Like, no more shooting a flower seed husk out of your mouth. By the way, if you go, all you need to know about baseball being an inferior sport is when you go to the sideline of any other sport, like you go to sideline of a football game, one guy's got the headphones on, he's talking to the guy up in the booth, the next guy's got the pad out, he's going over the schematic with the defensive captain, this guy over here is a 700 pound black man who's sucking from an oxygen mask, you know, you go to the baseball, you go to the dugout, they're like, oh, I'm going to 
make a pyramid of husk out of my corn seeds, and this other guy's turn his hat inside out. I'm going to make a rally hat out of this. These two guys are over there playing pickle. There's nothing going on. So we'll get 100 games. Uh, who cares? And the folks, the real winners of this entire virus, of course, your Houston Astros. I mean... <laughs> They were about to get more pitches thrown at them than Steven Spielberg at a Starbucks in Santa Monica. And they've avoided the entire season of getting a ball thrown. I mean, they were going to, every one of their players was going to have to climb inside of a Gatorade bucket, <laughs> just pull the bottoms up, poke armholes, and waddle up, and then just get beaten by balls all day. All right, so uh, baseball, good. We don't need it, thankfully. We'll get, we'll do a hundred game season. Everyone will be fine. And uh, the saddest person in the world is the person who keeps score when they're up in the stands. You know, like, oh, is that a, is that a forced error? Is that unforced error? Wait, is that a hit or an error? Also, can I say this about baseball? What's up with the pine tar? Has anyone ever been in contact with pine tar? I touched some pine tar in 1981 in high school. My finger still smells like a Christmas tree. What is that thing where it has to be all over the top of the bat and all over the front of your helmet? The schmutz and the schmegma there with the... Get your damn pine rag, get your pine tar rag, wipe your bat down, and then go to the plate. How do you think it works? And by the way, how do baseball players work when they're not using the pine tar, like at home? You think one of them's barbecuing and the spatula just goes sailing out of their hand? Like, I've lost my sense of grip. I was changing my daughter's diaper the other night, I threw her out of the window. Got to get some pine tar up in here. It's a wooden stick that's made to be held by a man. How much pine tar do we need on there? It's got to be all over the hat. Get the pine tar, do in the dugout, show up and swing that damn uh, bat. All right, so, but you, ever, you guys smell pine tar? It's good. It's good, yeah. Hey, any kids thinking about uh, huffing uh, copier toner later on? Go pine tar. It's a much better high. All right, hand up. Go ahead, right there. Crenshaw. Dan Crenshaw? Sure. Yeah, or any Crenshaw. Okay. <laughs> we'll go with the one who's uh, most familiar to us tonight, Dan Crenshaw. I am a, I'm a fan of his. I wish I had license to wear an eye patch, you know what I mean? <laughs> you got to have license to wear an eye patch. I could rock an eye patch, but I would immediately be called a douche because they'd go... <laughs> Why are you wearing an eye patch? And I wouldn't have anything good. You know what I mean? I wouldn't stepped on a bouncing Betty and to Crete. It would be nothing like that. I'd just be like, uh, I was beating off and I used too much lube. And I think my, I just kind of lost. There's not a lot to hold on to. And I just kind of, I should have grabbed the pine tar. I, I put... I, I had an infected cuticle, and it just kind of hit the retina there, and so... That eye patch, man. But what is... You know, the thing about... Now, let me tell you something. Dan has made a very shrewd choice with the black eye patch that goes around, because he could have chose the other eye patch, which is the flesh-colored eye patch with the weird gauze and the adhesive back thing on it. That's the saddest eye patch of all time. <laughs> You go from international jewel thief to uh, junkie the methadone clinic <laughs> with just your decision in eye patches. So he, I don't know if he has some valet or some publicist who works on that, but that black eye patch was the greatest decision ever. And uh, the, uh, he had the, the glass eye with like what what insignia he has the he has a flag on there he has the uh he has like a, the he has, sorry has yeah had the navy seal crest on there like it it's it's crazy it kind of makes me wish i was missing an eye but i'm not gonna go 
I'm not going to go that, uh, that far that far with it. But, uh, yeah, Dan Crenshaw, war hero, uh, all-around good guy, like good sense of humor, right? <laughs> Plus, you know, the, the, the only tough part about Dan Crenshaw is, you know, everyone feels the need to come up with their own story of pain and misery. Like, it's like losing a dog. You ever lose? If you took your dog an hour ago to the vet to be euthanized and you told someone, I'm pretty broken up today, I had to uh, put my dog down earlier this afternoon, they'd go, oh yeah, I remember sushi, that was my dog, we had to put her down, and I'd be like, that was nine years ago, bitch, this is my story, it's fresh. But if you tell anyone you had a cold, they tell you how they had a cold. If you tell anyone you had the flu, the flu, a dog died, dog died. And anytime there's an injury, like if you tell someone, oh man, I busted myself up snowboarding, then they tell you a story about how they jacked themselves up skiing one time. So Dan Crenshaw has to go through his entire adult life going, uh, yeah, my interpreter stepped it, stepped on IED and he blew up and I got hit with shrapnel. And then everyone has to go, yeah, one morning it was really cold, and I was barefoot, and I got out of bed. And you know the metal frame always sticks out a little further than the box spring, but the dust cover is always hiding it? I kicked that bad boy with my pinky. It was my little toe. It wasn't even the big toe. It was a little toe. So, you know, we've all been there. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't choppered out, I mean, heloed out, but my, uh, my wife did go online to, uh, MD online, I think it was. It said hot, cold compresses, you know. I'm not, I'm not calling myself a hero, I'm just saying. I felt the pain of war. That cold autumn morn. Every single day, he's got to fucking talk to guys like that who have to then give them their one-upper stories in the pain department. But uh, Dan Crenshaw, I think that guy's going to be the president. I really do. I... Yeah. Oh, vice president, me. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, three eyes on that ticket. There's no... There's only one eye in president. Wait a minute, how many eyes are in president? <laughs> There's one or two. I have a, I went to, I'm a product of LA Unified School District. President. There's one eye in president? But there's three eyes on this ticket, bitch. Look, I'm just spitballing, people. This is not actually gone to work on the, on the, on the posters yet. All right, uh, over here, a hand, a hand, a hand in the middle. Dr. Drew. Dr. Drew. Yeah. You'll be next, miss. I, I, yes, Dr. Drew. He's a good man. He's a, a man of exquisite passion. Yeah. He, uh, he's a little bit gullible, Dr. Drew. And uh, it reminds me of a story. But he, he wants to help. That's the whole thing. He's wildly earnest and sincere. And so when he gets taken out to the woodshed by uh, all the asswipes on Twitter because he's basically talking about his medical knowledge and stuff that essentially happened. He has to apologize for it because he feels horrible, but he's trying to help everybody. But one time, many years ago, me and Dr. Drew were in New York. We're in Manhattan. Now, Times Square used to be really dicey, and then they've kind of cleaned it up, and it's now turned into a, a, a commercial endeavor, but it was really dicey. And we used to do Loveline. If you could imagine, I would do Loveline from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. New York time. Then Dr. Drew and I would walk back to our hotel, and then I would go to bed at 4, and then I would wake up at 5.30 and go do Howard Stern show for four hours, which is in, an insane sleep depression. Worse than the Navy SEAL training, I would say. <laughs> I don't know if Dan's still here, but if he hears me, I stand by. He, 
He knows I'm right. <laughs> Gotta get up early and tell jokes. He had to carry a rubber raft. That's not hard. <laughs> Telling jokes. <laughs> Sleep deprived. Come on. So, uh, we're walking home from CBS downtown at like 3.15 a.m. on like a Tuesday night. And we're walking right through town. And a big, it was a minivan. It was like a minivan filled with prostitutes. It's like, it's like they were trying to set a record. You know, <laughs> like they would do back in the 50s. Like how many freshmen could get in a phone booth? Well, this is like how many whores can get in a minivan? And so there's like 15 prostitutes in this minivan. And Dr. Drew and I were like walking across the street. And three of them went like, yoo-hoo, can we get a little help over here, sugar? And Drew went, those ladies are in need of my assistance. And he started (laughs) walking at them. And I like grabbed his arm and I started pulling him back. And he's like, those young ladies requested assistance. What's wrong with you? And I'm like... It's Times Square, it's Wednesday, it's 3.15. They're wearing Lee press-on nails and have hair extensions. Every part of their body's extended. Their nails, their hair, it's all extended. No, those are prostitutes. And he's like, prostitutes? What's going on? So um, <clears throat> Drew can be a little bit gullible sometimes. He's, uh, he's also... Uh, what I would uh, what I would call pussy whipped. I think uh, I think he knows that. I think he would admit that. But uh, other than that, hell of an American. All right, right behind that uh, person. Sorry, who? Texas. Man, uh, it's a little humid out here. I gotta say, I'm doing a lot of sweating out here. But uh, I like the people. Uh, I like. Um, I like the attitude, and I like the fact that Texas is proud of being Texas. So we're, we're, you know, I'm from California, so our saying is like, California, sorry about that, dude. Like, I I know it sucks, right? Sorry. Like, we have to just apologize all the time when people come to visit. Like, I know you had to climb over a pyramid of homeless people to get into your rental car. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sorry about the pollution. We have barbed wire around our freeway signs. That's insane. We have a horrible... uh, We have the highest taxes, I think, in the union. I think we pay, like, 13% to taxes, which drives me... Drives me nuts. And then Texas is, uh, Texas is proud. And also, uh, I learned from the great uh, Randy White, you don't mess with Texas. You don't litter. Uh, California, we have all those signs up by the side of the freeway, which is, if you got litter that you didn't want to throw on the highway in Texas, bring it on down <laughs> and toss it on our interstates, because we love trash. So uh, we don't have don't mess with and we don't have the uh, Lone Star and we don't have the uh, Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders or the, okay, the Houston Texanettes or whatever. I don't know what they're, I don't know what they're called anymore. The point is, is yes, California has uh, zero pride about California. By the way, California. Now, Texas is going to turn into this, so you guys are going to have to deal with this. Well, no. It's not, it's not, it may not turn into California, but the problem with California is nobody is from California. So, we treat California like you treat a rental car. Like, you go... Because no one's from California. You know when you're in a rental car and you're like, what have we got going about 55 and then put it in reverse? What do you think would happen? <laughs> There's only one way to find out. That's what people do with California. They just show up. They're from New Jersey. They're from Pittsburgh. They're from Boston. And they just show up. I'm from California. I can't find one goddamn Rams fan at a sports bar. <laughs> Do you know, Cali, where Los Angeles has more Pittsburgh Steelers sports bars than they do Los Angeles Rams sports bars? 
So everyone's just from somewhere else, and why shouldn't you litter, or why shouldn't you take a whiz in that guy's mail slot, or why should you pay your taxes, or why should you not sleep on freeway overpasses, or why should you do anything if you're not from there? It's all one big party that's being thrown at someone else's house, and you don't like that. Now, Texas started off, I mean, we talked to Dan Crenshaw, that guy's, you know, ninth generation at Texas. He is his grandma fought at the Alamo or something. I don't know. She's a tough woman, a lot of dust, you know, very dusty environment back then, but they, they were tougher. They had true grit. Grit comes from dust. That's what happens. They call, that's what they say, true grit, Texas, the gritty Texas people with the, with the dust. That, look it up. That's a fact. But now you guys are going to have to start dealing with a lot of douchebags from Manhattan and California and Chicago and Boston. And they're going to come over here and they're going to go, well, we fled our failing states and cities, but let us coach you up on just what to do. Oh, okay, so uh, you just went one for 150 from the free th three throw stripe, and now you want to coach me how to, how to fucking shoot free throws? I don't think so. So you guys are going to have to stay the course and not listen, and, not listen to all the ass wipes <laughs> that come out here. All right, let's do one more. What do we got right up here? Millennials, oh boy. My God, we are, uh, uh, listen, I, on, 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 I would fear millennials. Like I, I, I would have a very realistic fear of millennials, but you don't have to fear them because they don't fucking move. So... <laughs> If you ever walk to a dark alley and there's millennials everywhere, you just walk. They won't even get off their bean bags. They won't move. Now, you must not fear them in a dark alley. Fear them in the workspace. That's where you got to fear the millennials. Fear the, I'm taking another me day. Or uh, my soccer team uh, over in the UK plays at 5 a.m. our time. So I had to stay up all night and drink Guinness. I'm not making it in tomorrow. Or you've offended my delicate sensibilities. Or you got to watch your tone when you talk to me. When I was coming up, I worked on construction sites. I had a bunch of guys that were Vietnam vets that were strung out on pain meds yelling, your last easy day was yesterday and we got a dime holding up a dollar. I had a millennial. I had my nephew try and work for me for four months I would have yelled at him for being late, but he was never there. So, like, I, I, I literally used to go, I'm going to go yell at my nephew. Where is he? And they'd go, he's not here. And I'd go, damn. I can't even yell at him for being late because he physically wasn't there. Listen, the good news is, is my kids could be missing a limb, have... Um, have Crohn's disease, Epstein-Barr virus, and uh, Lyme disease, and still outwork half these little shits by just showing up to work. I don't know how it got to where it is today, but we must reverse this course. Something is going on. There's some enabling that's happening. I blame the parents. I blame the teachers. I blame everybody but me. <laughs> I know that sounds convenient, but I... Look it up. It's on record. I've been yelling at my nanny to raise my kids right for 12 years. She's a dutiful Guatemalan woman who does what I ask. So this one ain't my fault. <laughs> All right, let me hit uh, Geico. I got to do a quick spot here. Geico, yes, these days everyone's staying home. Well, you're not staying home. 
I'm going home and then staying home because I live in California. Now, Geico realizes you're not driving as much as you used to drive. And so they're going to give you something back. 15% credit on car and motorcycle policies for current new customers because uh, Geico's committed to the long haul. That's a 15% credit, and uh, it'll last the full term of your policy. That is Geico. All right, I want to thank the Houston Food Bank for coming out here and taking my money. What? I want to thank you guys for buying a ticket and coming out here today. I want to thank Dan Crenshaw for coming out here. And until next time, this is Adam Kroll for Dan Crenshaw saying mahalo. Meet Stacy. Stacy's on the hunt for a new pair of trendy glasses. Call me picky, but I just can't find the one. Luckily for Stacy, Walmart Vision has virtual try on. Now she can try on hundreds of frames virtually, then upload her prescription and get new glasses delivered right to her door. Really? <laughs> yeah, really. Well, the hunt just took a turn for the better. Buy your next pair of glasses with virtual try on from Walmart. Welcome to Easy Eye Care. Welcome to your Walmart. Restrictions apply. See Walmart.com for details.